Chapter Four of the World's Lumber Room by Selina Gay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four: Dust Makers and Dust Carriers, Running Water. Something more than three fifths of the rain which falls over England and Wales sinks into the ground and goes to feed the springs, from which, in dry weather, except in the neighbourhood of snow-clad mountains. All brooks, streams, and rivers derive their whole supply of water, and as these increase in volume the farther they flow, it is evident that they must receive supplies not only at their source but at various points along their course. The river Churn, for instance, starts with a flow of eleven cubic feet of water per minute, but a quarter of a mile from the springhead. Though it has not been joined by any visible tributary streams, the flow has increased to thirty-one cubic feet, and at a distance of five miles and a half, it has increased again to three hundred and twenty cubic feet. So that other and perhaps many small springs must have discharged themselves into it. Now all running water, whether it flows above or below ground, has some power of wearing away its channel. Flowing at the rate of but three inches a second, it will tear up fine clay. At double this speed, it will remove fine sand. At twelve inches, it will sweep away fine gravel, and at three feet, it will roll along stones as big as an egg. While mountain torrents, which have dwindled to mere threads, swell in a few hours to such a size that they will carry before them sand, mud, rocks, and trees. Will sweep away bridges and bury meadows ten or fifteen feet deep in rubbish. Then again, a mere dribble of water flowing perpetually over limestone rocks will, in time, produce results such as seem to be quite out of proportion to its size. And we may, in fact, safely affirm that even the most sluggish stream wears its bed more or less in one way or another, either chemically or mechanically. It is when they are provided with tools of just the right sort, however, that streams and rivers get through most work in the way of carving and grinding, from the banks, cliffs, etc., between which they flow. They receive constant supplies of mineral matter, which, having been loosened by alternate frost and thaw, are washed and blown into them by rain and wind. The more rapid the stream, the more quickly these contributions are carried along, and the harder blows they give to the sides and bed of the stream, as well as to one another. The larger fragments are rolled along the bottom, deepening the bed, wearing off one another's sharp corners, rounding the angles of any rocks they may meet, undermining the cliffs and pounding the smaller fragments like so many pestles in a mortar. Until they are reduced to gravel, sand, or mud, which is then floated farther down the stream, it is by the gravel and sand, though they look so much less important than the boulders, that the river's chief work is done. But much depends upon the inclination of the bed and consequent rapidity of the current, as well as upon the nature of the rocks with which it has to deal. Even a small rivulet, when flooded, will transport from one to three thousand tons of gravel in a day, and during the rainy season in India, when every river and mountain torrent are swollen, when for days and nights together nothing is heard but the crash of trees and boulders and great masses of earth and rock, three or four thousand feet in length, fall from the mountain side and are ground to sand and mud in the boiling waters. The channel of every stream, great and small, is enlarged, and enormous quantities of mineral matter are carried down to the ocean. One river in Bengal removes a depth of ninety feet of stone and earth from its bed every year, and the Ganges brings down in the same time more than enough solid material to build up forty-two great pyramids. The Americans have a saying that in time of flood. The big muddy, as they call the Missouri, is too thick to swim in and too thin to walk upon. For winter in the northwestern states is long and severe. 
the rivers, streams and brooks are all fast frozen, and the country is covered with colossal heaps of snow, which sometimes attain well-nigh fabulous dimensions. Then suddenly, almost without warning, comes the intense heat of summer. The streams are set free, the snow is melted with lightning rapidity, violent torrents of rain fall, the brooks are swollen into rivers, the rivers into boiling, mud-laden floods, which at once burst their bounds, inundate the valleys, overthrow trees, houses, mills, and sweep away whole tracts of land in one place, while they pile up immense islands and sandbanks in another. Owing to the character of the country through which they flow, there is indeed little or nothing to restrain their progress for the highlands are either not wooded at all or so sparsely covered with trees that the river banks have but little power of resistance and the clayey sandy soil of the prairies intersected by numerous deep rain-made watercourses is still less capable of opposing the flood of waters it is when we look farther west still however that we are perhaps most impressed by the magnitude of the work accomplished by rivers for here they have to deal not with yielding banks of sand, but with the solid rock which becomes a permanent monument of their mighty power. The Colorado, with the Green River, as it is called during the first part of its course, is two thousand miles long, and the upper two-thirds of the basin which it drains lie at a height of from four thousand to eight thousand feet above the sea, surrounded by snow-clad mountains. During winter the snow falls heavily, filling all the gorges and covering all the hills, and when summer comes and the great piles melt, millions of cascades leap down from the rocks on all sides. Ten million cascades, writes Mr. J. W. Powell, rush together and form ten thousand torrent creeks. These again unite to form a hundred rivers beset with cataracts, and a hundred roaring rivers unite to form the Colorado, which rolls a mad, turbid stream into the Gulf of California. The current is at all times strong and rapid, and is provided with exactly the right tools in the shape of mud, sand, and boulders, the last of which, indeed, while wearing the bed of the river, are still more worn themselves, being finally reduced to mud, which is more or less dissolved before reaching its journey's end. Footnote. The velocity of the water and stone in the Cataract Canyon is equal to that of a railway train going forty miles an hour. End of footnote. But the sand is the most important tool, and the river has used it to such purpose that it has cut the rock into deep gorges or canyons which extend throughout more than a thousand miles of its course, and are from six hundred feet to more than a mile deep, though in some parts only twenty or thirty feet wide. The great river, when viewed from above, dwindles to a silver thread at the bottom of these gloomy sunless gorges, through whose long length no one in these days is known to have passed alive, except the members of the exploring expeditions sent out in 1869 and 1872, though horrible tales are current of the sufferings of those who, having once taken refuge within them, have found escape well nigh impossible. In addition to the enormous height of the cliffs, there is the further difficulty that they are for the most part undermined, the weathering above being quite unable to keep pace with the rapid working of the river below. The only practicable points of exit, therefore, are at the rare openings made in these giant walls where the river is joined by its tributaries. Each tributary of the Colorado, every branch of each tributary, and each little stream and rill, has cut for itself similar canyons on a larger or smaller scale and hence the whole country is such a perfect labyrinth of chasms that it is a difficult matter to choose routes for railroads and other traffic. In the adjoining state of New Mexico, similar canyons, some of them a thousand feet deep, have been cut in the sandstone by the rivers Mora and Canadian. 
At the junction of the two rivers, the canyon was at one time 860 feet deep, but was afterwards filled to a depth of 470 feet by a stream of basaltic lava from a neighbouring volcano. Since those days, however, the united rivers have worked to such purpose that the whole of the basalt and 230 feet more of the sandstone have been cut through, making the gorge now 1,090 feet deep. As a rule, rivers are more apt to deepen than to widen their beds, the friction being greater at the bottom than at the sides and usually the weathering of the cliffs or banks produced by frost, thaw, wind, rain or air goes on more rapidly than the grinding below. But canyon-making rivers work at greater speed than these atmospheric influences, and the Canadian and Mora, after cutting a narrow passage through the middle of the lava, went on to undermine it, so that it now projects in a wide terrace on either side, deep down within the gorge. The neighbouring river of La Platte, on the other hand, though its bed slopes on the whole as much as that of the Colorado, and it has plenty of sand, makes no such canyons, for its load is just as much as it can carry, and more than it can use with effect. Its banks, too, are not hard and solid enough to stand as walls, and the loose sandstone of which they are composed is blown or washed into the river as fast as it crumbles down, and almost chokes the stream. Too little sand, on the other hand, will be swept onwards without making any impression, and it is when the quantity is nicely proportioned to the force and volume of the current that the most striking results are achieved. When pieces of rock are first broken off, whether by the force of the stream itself or the action of frosts, etc., they are, of course, all angles, and as these prevent their rolling along easily, they are carried but a little way at first, and then left to be ground down into more manageable shapes and sizes. Smaller, rounder pebbles are carried farther, and in the case of short, rapid rivers are not dropped until they reach the sea and rounded pieces of porous pumice stone are found floating down the Amazons one and two thousand miles away from the volcanoes Cotopaxi, etc., whence they must certainly have come, although the Brazilians, who use them to remove rust from their guns, firmly believe them to be solidified river foam. Having travelled so far, they would be pretty sure of being floated out to sea, but their case is exceptional, and generally speaking, the nearer we come to the mouth of a river, the finer is the mineral matter which it carries, and before it has finished its course, its load has been so thoroughly sorted by the dropping of all the heavier portions, one after the other, that at last it carries nothing but the finest mud, which on reaching the sea is then carried farther by waves and currents, until finally deposited in the largest department of the world's great lumber-room. If, however, the river should fall into an almost tideless sea, such as the Mediterranean, Caribbean, or Gulf of Mexico, much of the mud, instead of being swept away, is deposited at its mouth, and this is the origin of the tongue of land at the mouth of the Mississippi, and also of the great triangular plain of Lower Egypt called the Delta, which, like all deltas, has been won from the sea. The Nile has cut for itself in the rocky surface of the desert a great trench three hundred feet deep, and from less than a mile to eight miles wide, and the whole of this solid stone it has ground into mud. On an average, it brings down nearly 131 cubic feet of sediment every second, so that it would take about 19 seconds to fill a room 17 feet long, 15 wide, and 10 high. Much of this sediment consists of the rich soil washed down from the highlands of Abyssinia, and to it Egypt owes her wonderful fertility for year by year it is spread over the whole surface covered by the inundation, renewing the land, which never need lie fallow, nor have any artificial aid to render it fertile, though the rate of increase is only about four inches and a half in a century. 
The Mississippi transports a larger load than the Nile, 147 cubic feet per second, while the Ganges outdoes them both, carrying as much as 557 cubic feet. Compared with these large rivers, the Thames seems but an infant, yet in the course of a twelve-month it manages to carry down the very respectable load of 1,865,900 cubic feet of solid matter, and the Danube, Po, and Rhone convey several hundred times as much. Since the greater part of the mineral matter carried away by rivers is ground extremely fine, as we have seen, it is quite evident that most of it must be conveyed into the ocean, for a specimen of Rhine water, though kept perfectly still, has been found to take four months to become quite clear, and the sediment could not therefore by any possibility have time to settle while being carried down by the river in the few days that would elapse before it reached the sea. We find, moreover, as a matter of fact, that while masses of rocks miles in thickness and thousands of miles in extent, whole continents, indeed, have been formed in the sea, the freshwater deposits of rivers, lakes and estuaries are to be reckoned only by some thousands of feet. The Rhine, as we have seen, drops part of its load in the comparatively still waters of Lake Constance, but though it emerges thence no longer muddy, its dark green colour shows that it is by no means perfectly filtered, and the finer particles are carried farther still. But besides the mud and those still finer particles which give to water its green or blue tint, rivers carry away a vast amount of mineral matter, which, though absolutely invisible to us, is none the less important. A very small pinch of powdered chalk will, we know, make a large glass of water quite milky, while a handful of salt will disappear, leaving it just as clear as before. The chalk is held in suspension, and in time will settle at the bottom of the glass, while the salt being dissolved or held in solution will not reappear until the water is removed, which may be done either by leaving it to evaporate or by boiling. When sea water is boiled, its various salts are left behind in the form of crystals, and the steam arising from it, if caught and condensed into water, will be found to be almost pure. In like manner the sun draws up large quantities of almost pure water from the ocean, leaving the salts behind. It is very evident that rivers are most heavily laden with sediment either during the rainy season, when large quantities of mineral matter, loosened by various agents, are washed down from their banks, or when the snow is melting on the mountains and rushing down in numberless torrents to the valleys. It is when the snows melt that the Rhine is at its fullest and muddiest, and often causes the waters of Lake Constance to rise as much as a foot in twenty-four hours, and the mineral which it chiefly conveys is carbonate of lime, which constitutes more than a third of the deposit left in the lake. On leaving the lake, the Rhine again passes through miles of limestone, as do also its tributaries, and yet the sediment which it finally takes to the ocean contains little or none. It does carry it, indeed, that we may be sure of, and in considerable quantities too, but not as visible sediment, for it has been dissolved by the carbonic acid of the water, and thus rendered invisible. Up to the time when it reaches the lake, the course of the river is so rapid and tumultuous that the carbonic acid has but little chance of doing anything, and the powdered limestone is simply carried down as sediment thus far. On leaving the lake, however, the river has a long course before it, and when it reaches the sea, all the carbonate of lime which itself and its various tributaries have collected, and even all that is washed into it in time of flood, has been so completely dissolved that we should not be aware of its presence but for the hardness it has given to the water. Next to carbonate of lime, the mineral which is carried down to the sea in the largest quantity is sulphate of lime, 
which never fails entirely except in the case of a few small rivers but we shall gain a better idea of the amount of mineral matter removed by the rivers when we come to see what is done with it meanwhile we may mention for those who like statistics that such rivers as the danube rhine rhone and elbe would in the course of eight thousand years have conveyed away in solution an amount of mineral matter equal in weight to the whole quantity of water discharged by them in a year in india the various dissolved carbonates contained in the river water are a source of some perplexity to the cultivators of the soil for as rain falls only at certain seasons and there are often long periods of drought large sums have been expended in conveying water to the fields by means of a system of irrigation and now that this has been done it is found that the land in some parts has been rendered actually unfit for cultivation by the large amount of mineral matter conveyed in the water and the question is how to get rid of it again when considering the dissolved minerals carried away by water we must bear in mind that they are not like the sediment taken only or even chiefly from the bed of the river and the banks between which it flows on the contrary they are drawn from far and wide from the whole area in fact which the river drains for the rain as it soaks through the earth dissolves something of every bed through which it passes footnote about a hundred tons of mineral matter are said to be annually dissolved per square mile all over the world of this about half is carbonate of lime End of footnote. the springs as they flow underground often by very complicated channels do the same and in fact the whole network of streams large and small above or below ground by which every river of any size is fed all contribute their share of dissolved mineral matter and are most strongly impregnated just when their waters are most transparently clear that is in time of drought when the rivers are fed almost entirely by springs alone the thames with its estuary receives the drainings of ten thousand square miles the seven of eight thousand five hundred and eighty the colorado of some three hundred thousand and the mighty amazons the mediterranean of the west of two million and forty eight thousand it is because it is taken from such wide areas that the large amount of rock annually removed and carried off to the sea makes so little apparent difference thus more than eight million tons are invisibly removed from england and wales alone each year and if this were taken equally from every part of the surface it would be nearly thirteen years before a foot in depth was carried away slowly but surely however all land traversed by streams of whatever size is being worn down and conveyed to the ocean and where the rocks are of chalk or limestone the work done is often perceptible enough the rivers of the teutoburger wald and haar for instance annually take away more carbonate of lime than would make a cube measuring a hundred feet each way and in sixty-seven days the powder springs carry off enough to build a cone a hundred and fifty feet in diameter and twenty-four feet deep one result of which is that landslips and subsidences are of constant occurrence in their vicinity scattered about on the tablelands of wiltshire and dorset are accumulations of flints sometimes several feet thick which once formed beds separated one from the other by many feet of chalk which has long since been dissolved and carried away and in many parts of the world vast caverns have been hollowed out in the rocks by the agency of water and carbonic acid alone in styria there is a wild desolate region where the rocks are so porous that every drop of rain at once passes through them and the surface is so dry that hardly any green thing will grow down below however the scene is one of great beauty for here are the famous adelsberg caverns halls excavated in the limestone some of which are more than two hundred and fifty feet long and lofty in proportion 
their richly sculptured roofs being supported by elaborately carved pillars, while many are adorned with statues, obelisks, clustered columns, birds, beasts, trees, plants, etc., all apparently chiselled out of pure white marble, though the only tools used have been water and carbonic acid. These, too, have dissolved the rock as they pass through it, and then, evaporating, have deposited the carbonate of lime again in these various forms, sometimes as stalactites of every size and shape, which hang from the roof like icicles, sometimes as cement, joining together broken fragments of rock. Sometimes, falling to the ground, they have built up wonderful stalagmitic columns, which vary from a few inches to several feet in diameter, and at others they have covered the walls with what look like festoons of drapery, while in one place they have woven a curtain about ten feet long and only an inch thick, which hangs in the most graceful folds and seems to wave gently to and fro as the light from the guide's lamp falls on it from above. All these various forms of ornament are due to the chemical action of water charged with carbonic acid, by means of which some of the carbonate of lime removed from above has here been redeposited. But the long lofty caverns which extend for miles have no doubt been excavated by the mechanical action of the poik, which at one part of its course disappears through an opening in the earth, and flowing underground for several miles, passes through one of the great halls just described on its way. In South Australia there is a series of limestone caverns, one of which has the appearance of an immense Gothic cathedral the roof being apparently supported by one huge stalactite tinted with almost every shade of colour, while the area is occupied by numerous half-finished stalagmites, which look in the dim light like kneeling worshippers. The stalactites in each cavern seem to possess a distinct character of their own, and differ one from the other as much as do the leaves of the forest. In one of the Bermuda caves there are grand stalagmitic columns reaching from floor to roof, one of which is beautifully fluted and fretted with stalactites and measures sixty feet in circumference. In another the stalactites hanging from the roof are perfectly white, some of them as fine as knitting needles and often yards long, while wherever there is a continuous crack in the roof there descends from it a graceful, soft-looking white curtain. Of all the limestone caves hitherto discovered, however, the most extensive is the Mammoth Cave of Kentucky, which, with its 226 avenues branching out from the main gallery, is computed to have a total length of about 160 miles. But our chief point now is that whether excavated by chemical or mechanical means, or by both, the vast quantities of limestone which once filled such caverns have been carried away to the ocean by the springs, streams and rivers which permeate and overspread the earth. End of chapter 4